you know, Mars is the closest place that we can reach with robotic exploration that we think had a really good chance of having ancient life. The Perseverance rover will land at a location called Jezero Crater. Jezero Crater is a very interesting place. It's a crater that once held a lake. There are a lot of craters on the surface of Mars that could have once hosted ancient lakes, but not every crater that we think had a lake actually preserves evidence that that lake was there. It had an inflow channel and it had an outflow channel. That means it was filled, the crater was filled with water. In Jezero, we have probably one of the most beautifully preserved delta deposits on Mars in that crater. This is a wonderful place to live for microorganisms, and it is also a wonderful place for those microorganisms to be preserved so that we can find them now so many billions of years later. There is no other place on Mars that has the unique combination of a lake setting, a beautifully preserved delta, and the diverse mineralogy that we have in Jezero Crater. So it's truly a special landing site. The major goal of the Perseverance mission is to investigate astrobiology on Mars, and in particular, to address the question of whether life ever existed on Mars. The Perseverance rover starts with a design that's very similar to Curiosity, but we've added to it a whole new set of science instruments. And these science instruments were purposefully selected to help us in the search for biosignatures. We're gonna be taking uh, microphones with us for the first time we're going to have uh, that human sense on another planet. Perseverance carries with her a grand experiment in space-faring technology, a helicopter, the name of which is now Ingenuity. One of the major upgrades that Perseverance has from Curiosity is that it's able to self-drive for a distance of up to 200 meters per day. As the rover is driving, it's literally building the map of the road it's driving on on Mars. Scientists for years have told us that to really unlock the secrets of Mars, we have to bring samples from Mars back to Earth. So what Mars 2020 is going to do is to drill samples, put them in small tubes. We're gonna seal it in its own individual tube. We set them on the surface to provide a target for the second two missions, which hopefully will get in development in the next several years and could potentially get the samples back to Earth by 2031. Perseverance is a very, very profound first step in both our understanding of our place in the universe and a stepping stone towards human exploration of Mars. Hi, everybody. It looks like people are coming in. Um, we've got about uh, 56 people so far that have been coming in, and hopefully we will see some more. Um, Welcome, my name is Jamie Butler. You probably all know me um, from all of these salty science videos or uh, webinars. Um, just a few things here. I see more people coming in and I'm still going to go over some logistics while we are waiting for everybody. So, um, again, like all of these, there's of uh, these webinars. Um, there are two ways to interact with the panelists that you see on your screen. There's a Q and A box. Um, that box, we can answer your questions live at the end of this webinar. You'll notice there's a little thumb up or a little thumb down. You can upvote these questions so we know if lots of people are wondering the same thing. And then please put your comments in the chat box if you have thoughts or um, you know, um, keep your questions to the Q&A box. But if you have links that you want to put in or thoughts, please use the chat box. Um, uh, this time I've put, you'll notice these QR codes that are all over my slides. You can take a picture of this and link to any of these resources just using the QR code. So all of the past sessions that we've had in this Salty Science series, and even lots of others with um, undergraduate research discussions or just videos that I thought pertained to Great Salt Lake, you can see on our YouTube channel, our Great Salt Lake Institute YouTube channel. Um, 
Um, we actually have one more to go after this one. Today we're talking about Am I on Mars or Great Salt Lake. Um, on February 11th, we'll be talking about the macroinvertebrates and microbial lights. So if you're a huge fan of, of brine shrimp um, and the macroinvertebrates in Great Salt Lake, you'll definitely want to come to that program. Um, again, there's a QR code in the corner if you, um, after listening to our talk about pink water and some of the research we're doing in the north arm of Great Salt Lake near the spiral jetty, if you're really wondering more about that, come on February 3rd at 6.30 p.m. for a discussion with myself and spiral jetty scholar Hikmet Lowe talking about um, spiral jetty. Um, that link is going to take you, um, there's a, a short video, you can kind of see what the environment looks like and um, hear, hear me talking about that, um, and then uh, discuss that with spiral jetty scholars. Um, we're really, 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 really excited about this. Um, we have partnered with the Ott Planetarium at Weber State University, and we are going to be doing a Mars rover watch party um, with Great Salt Lake Institute and Ott Planetarium. So link at this QR code and, and you can um, sign up, to, you can register to be part of that watch party and we'll send you cool links like the video that I just showed. And, you know, we're getting ready to talk about brand shrimp in February at our next Salty Seminar. And um, again, link to this QR code that's in the corner, but we're gonna be giving out these cool little beaker bags that have live algae and brand shrimp that you can experiment on and grow brand shrimp in your own house. Um, there will be um, curriculum built for fifth graders and we're kind of using this as an opportunity to test out and experiment how these how these work. And so right now, um, I, I love this picture because, you know, it's taken from the Interna International Space Station. And right in the middle of this, you can see the, the um, salt flats and the wet, West Desert and Great Salt Lake. You can see the pink water in the North Arm and the green water in the South Arm. Um, today we're going to go to Roselle Point um, that's in the North Arm of Great Salt Lake where um, we're going to be talking about Mars and tar seeps and um, all sorts of kind of extraterrestrial weird stuff. And you might have heard about Spiral Jetty. If you haven't, you maybe have been living under a rock. Um, spiral Jetty is a piece of land art that was put um, in the bed of Great Salt Lake at Roselle Point. And um, people make pilgrimages to come and see Spiral Jetty. And in this picture, you can see, this is from an airplane, you can see Spiral Jetty, but it's not the only jetty that's out there. You'll see um, above that, there's this dark line this is um, an old oil exploration jetty um, that, that we have started doing some research. Um, so we definitely will be talking about space today. Um, we have um, Scott Pearl here from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory with NASA, um, and they're daring to do mighty things. But I, I don't know if you know that we have a JPL here um, it's Jamie's Petroleum Ladies because um, all of these wonderful college students um, have started to study entrapment of animals um, here at the Roselle Tar Seeps in this kind of funny, um, very, um, it, it, it's a very extraterrestrial world to me. Um, this is Kara that we're going to be hearing from in just a minute. Kara um, was the first student that, that we tricked into joining us, the Jamie's Petroleum Ladies, to study these tar seeps. Um, and she really got this whole project started. You can see um, it looks like, you know, her tracks are going through this tar. It kind of looks like the tracks that are on the moon from the astronauts. 
and then, you know, she has passed this on to um, Kayla Martin that we will hear from later and Mary Sanchez and Kenzie Campbell was along for the ride to take pictures. But we um, sometimes, you know, not all of the people who study these tar seeps with us are ladies, um, but, but the men who do study with us are cool enough that they can join the Jamie's Petroleum Ladies, the JPL at Great Salt Lake. And so um, I'm, I'm gonna do a whole bunch of introductions right now so that we can get into all of the, the fun stuff that you would rather hear about. Um, you know, this workout at the Tar Seeps actually started with um, Greg McDonald. He's a regional paleontologist for the Bureau of Land Management. Prior to transferring to the BLM, he worked for the National Park Service as the senior curator of natural history paleontology program coordinator and as the paleontologist at Hagerman Fossil Beds National Monument. Before coming to the federal government, he was the curator of vertebrate paleontology at the Cincinnati Museum of Natural History and collections manager for the vertebrate paleontology at um, Idaho Museum of Natural History. He earned his doctorate at the University of Toronto, masters at the University of Florida and bachelors at Idaho State University. His research focuses on the extinct giant ground sloths and their relatives um, um, in North, Amer North and South America. His interest in the tar seeps at Great Salt Lake reflects that he has been stuck working on fossils from tar pits for many years, including those from Rancho La Brea in California, which he first visited as a boy, as well as fossils from tar pits in Ecuador, Peru, and Venezuela. And um, Greg, Greg, um, I got in touch with Greg because I heard that he was one of those crazy people that had been out to visit the tar seeps. And he was really excited about some of the things that he saw and nobody knew why these owls, he found these owls that had been entrapped and, you know, we didn't know why. And it brought up these questions of, well, what else is being entrapped and why is it being entrapped? And, and let's study this. And so we tricked Kara, Kara Kornhauser. She's a current biology and wildlife master's student at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Her graduate work focuses on the impacts of climate change on Arctic pollinators. She is a ski patroller, advocate for children in foster care and community educator. During her undergraduate studies with environmental science at Westminster College, Kara worked with uh, Great Salt Lake Institute and myself with Greg McDonald um, to research the Roselle Point tar seeps. Greg's experience studying the Brea tar pits in Los, Los Angeles. Oh, I'm sorry. I already told you all of this. <laughs> so um, interestingly enough, um, there's another person that we got, we infected with a love for Great Salt Lake. Um, she came along with us the first time Greg and I met. She came along with us out to this tar seeps and um, it has led to um, this really fabulous partnership with Great Salt Lake Institute and herself. Um, Gretchen Henderson is the Associate Director for Research at the Harry Ransom Center and Senior Lecturer at the University of Texas at Austin. She was recently the Annie Clark Tanner Fellow in Environmental Humanities at the University of Utah and Writer in Residence in Nature Writing at the Jan Mikowski Foundation for Writing and Literature in Switzerland. Her writing has been published widely, most recently in Ecotone, um, the Kenyan Review, Nature Dam Review, with co-authored pieces in Nature Su Sustainability and forthcoming in Conservation Biology. A writer whose work crosses disciplinary and artistic boundaries, her fourth book was Ugliness, A Cultural History. Um, and her opera libretto on the climate crisis, Cassandra in the Temples, premiered in performance um, at M MIT. Her book, she wrote a book on life in the tar seeps is forthcoming in 2021 from Trinity University Press. So I would love to invite Gretchen to turn her video on and microphone and um, read to us. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Jamie. And it's honestly my great, great honor to be here this evening to introduce this 
um, event on Am I on Mars or Great Salt Lake um, to bring you to an otherworldly place um, and with some otherworldly people who have been fortunate to spend uh, some time with the past few years. Um, Jamie kindly asked me to introduce this evening with a brief excerpt from my book on life in the tar seats. Um, as she mentioned, that's just forthcoming um, and that features a number of folks in this evening's program. So just for those of you who have tuned in a little late, I'm going to uh, share my screen and we'll drop you into uh, the tar seeps here. Great Salt Lake, again, the, um, up in the remote north arm of Roselle Point near Spiral Jetty. Again, to orient you to these little dots, these black dots near the, um, near the, the oil jetty. And we're gonna drop onto the mud flats to that date that Jamie referenced um, back in February of 2018 when Jamie, Greg, and I all first met. Cracked mud flats seemed to spread for miles toward Great Salt Lake. Rusting drums and forgotten pylons mark abandoned attempts at oil drilling. Winds whip us with salty air. As I gaze over the sweep of sand and mud, black mounds start to constellate out of the seeming voids, dense starry clusters. Once you learn to identify a seep, Greg says, you start to see them everywhere. The tar seeps spread across the sand like frozen black puddles. Some are flat and thin, others are bubbly and raised tar volcanoes. Others freeze in delicate laceworks where their heated ooze met the mud and radiated in fractal-like patterns. Most have liquid edges as if they're melting, but in winter are firm as hardened plastic. In Los Angeles, you can't do this, Greg says, referring to the famed La Brea tar pits. Here we've got a fairly raw site that has had minimal disturbance. It becomes an important baseline for understanding the whole process. We can't go back and photograph a mammoth or a saber-toothed cat getting stuck, but we can certainly look at the conditions and see what's getting preserved. We keep walking through the chill, pulling our coats tighter. Look at that pelican death assemblage, Greg says. We walk toward the archipelago of black mounds and stuck bones. There's a skull, Greg says, and a bill, Jamie adds, pointing to the hooked beak. There's a humorous, Greg adds, noting the disintegrating collagen. Tar is considered a perfect preservative, freezing, drying, encasing organisms as when they were alive, fossilizing a lifespan in fragments. Jamie points with excitement into the bone pile, drawing my eye to two bright green metal tags from the GSLI's pelican count. White pelicans are understudied, she says, pointing offshore to Gunnison Island, a prime nesting site that provides refuge to about 20,000 white pelicans annually. Because they feed at the Bear River Refuge, she says, on their first flight, they have to fly over 30 miles right over the shore, so a number of them get trapped here. The refuge sits at the convergence of the Pacific and Central Flyways, where millions of birds annually migrate and nest. People don't think the lake is worth anything aesthetically, biologically, or economically, Jamie says, but we want people to steward the lake. It's a place of paradoxes. It doesn't have an icon. Who connects to brine shrimp and microbes? People come expecting to find romantic red rock, but don't find it. It's stinky. You go out and find dead birds. You float an itch when you swim. There are all these funny, weird things about Great Salt Lake that aren't always described. People know pelicans, she continues. If we could connect people to pelicans, we could connect them to uphill water diversions, climate change, and impacted marshlands. She picks out the green metal tags, laughing about how she loves to find dead birds. Dead is an indication of how much life is here, Greg says. He gestures beyond the tar seeps. If you have an animal that is used to wandering through the area in cold temperatures when it's not sticky, it sets up a trail. Conditions change with the seasons, warming up the seeps. Suddenly it's following its trail and part of it crosses a sticky tar seep. It becomes an entrapment event. We need to be thinking about what the fossil sites are telling us. That becomes part of the story. The story is unfolding before our eyes in slow motion, swirling together past and future in the present chill. Let's find those owls, Greg says. We follow him across the mud flats, continuing away from Spiral Jetty. You need some gypsum, Jamie says to me, dropping to her knees. She pokes and prods the mud, pulls out a crystalline wedge and encourages me to take it. I turn the crescents over in my hands. 
light seeps through the glassy surface. Gypsum, salt, and evidence of water are found on Mars, just like here at Spiral Jetty, Jamie explains, also describing halophiles, salt-loving microorganisms that grow in little water and tint the lake pink or orange. The GSLI's director, Bonnie Baxter, partners with NASA to study the extreme environment of Great Salt Lake as an analog for Mars. Not many places on Earth are like that, Jamie says. Great Salt Lake is one of them. What if you could fi also find halophiles life on Mars? It's more likely that halophiles will be our aliens, she adds, not green little men. And before I hand it over, I just want to introduce you to um, some of our speakers tonight through uh, their presence in the field and the instruments they use. Here's Jamie um, with Pelican Tags and Greg uh, consulting his field notebook to uh, find the, the GPS coordinates to find the owls. And Kara came on a couple of months after that uh, day that I just described um, when she set these camera traps in and became the lead student researcher on the project on a much warmer day where the tar seat started to melt and there are my footprints in a tar seat that was hidden by sand. Um, so before I pass it over, I just want to thank the collaborative stewards of Roselle Point, the Great Salt Lake Institute, the Utah Museum of Fine Arts, the Dia Art Foundation, and the Utah Division of Forestry, Fire, and State Lands. And of course, any visitor, including you, who may visit as we try to collectively care for this place. Thank you so much. Kara. Hi, thank you, Gretchen. That was amazing. And uh, your words are so beautiful. And I love hearing you speak. And I can't wait to read your, your writing more as your book comes out. Um, and I want to, before I start, uh, take a minute to say thank you to Jamie, Bonnie, and David and Great Salt Lake Institute for putting this together. It's really fun to be able to have a place to speak about uh, Rosal Point tar seeps and, um, and also get to see everyone. It's a bit of a flashback for me. Um, Kayla Martin will also be speaking for a bit at the end of this presentation. And so I um, wanna welcome Kayla as well. So yes, I'm Kara Kornhauser and um, I'm just gonna get right into it and talk to you a bit about how this project began um, some of it is things that Bonnie and, or uh, Jamie and Gretchen have already touched on, but um, I'm going to tell it from my perspective a little bit. So before beginning this project, uh, I had no idea what a tar seep was. Uh, I had vaguely heard of the La Brea tar pits in LA and had just started working for Great Salt Lake Institute as an office assistant. Uh, as Jamie said, uh, they tricked me into this project. Um, which may or may not be the case. Uh, I was really excited to be involved in research. And, um, and here are Jamie and Greg, both getting dangerously close to getting stuck in a tar seat themselves. Um, when Greg, and when Jamie told me that Greg had found 12 owls trapped in a single tar seat on the bed of Great Salt Lake, this really intrigued me. Um, and it intrigued him as he had studied uh, the La Brea tar pits and, um, I was just fascinated with the entrapments. As the regional BLM paleontologist, he needed the help of a student with more time to take on the project. So while my peers started studying uh, birds and plants and pelicans, I started studying these strange, sticky, oozing tar pools, and I had honestly no idea what I was getting into or where it would lead. But it led to the edge of the north arm of Great Salt Lake, which is right down the lake bed from Spiral Jetty. Um, this was always a treat to go visit while we were out there. And it would be a way that I would trick friends to come out and visit the tar seeps and help me with my research by saying that we would get to go see the spiral jetty. Um, I had a bunch of friends who had visited here but had never been to the tar seeps themselves. On my first trip pulling up to the lake, I felt as though I was on another planet. The lake blood is incredibly flat and stretches for miles. On the Southern horizon is the Great Salt Lake the pink water and few islands scattered throughout. In all other directions are desolate hills and high desert mountains. Luckily, the two hour drive from Salt Lake City is not as taxing as a trip to Mars might be. Uh, when we got to the parking lot and I saw the lake bed for the first time, I wouldn't have been surprised to see a little Mars rover out exploring the extraterrestrial landscape. Walking out to the tar seeps on the oil, old oil jetty with a nerd wagon full of fence posts, trail cameras, post pounders, zip ties, and a couple of other brave students, 
We began to smell the tar seeps, and as we walked out onto the lake bed, our feet and wagon wheels swooshed into the soggy ground. As we got to the seeps, we noticed that they came in many different shapes and sizes. Some had a volcano at the center and were bubbling like these ones. They have a mound that's encrusted with tar, sand, and sometimes even salt. And each have a sticky inner crater. Other seeps are more flat like flypaper, and they spread out over the lake bed. Sometimes they meet water and the tar forms ribbons in the water. Natural tar seeps form by oil that escapes through fissures and cracks in the ground and allows tar to flow to the surface. Uh, this particular oil reservoir is located just 80 feet below the lake bed, and it was an area of interest for oil extraction from 1904 to 1996. During this period of interest of oil extraction, the lake was significantly higher than it is now. Um, if you're looking at this image, the tar seeps would have been just up into the right of this um, watercraft. Um, and with fluctuating lake levels, the seeps have been exposed at times and underwater at other times. With continued decreasing in, decreases in lake level and increased hum, in, human impact on water flowing into the terminal lake, it's likely that uh, the seeps will remain exposed for the foreseeable future. So when oil extraction was no longer viable at Rosal Point, the lake level was well above the tar seeps. And once the lake levels dropped, the remnants of the old oil exploration created an eerie landscape with old pier pilings and random scraps of metal that you might have seen in some of the previous pictures. In the early 2000s, the EPA uh, cleaned up this site, capping old oil wells and removing old vehicles and scrap metal. Most recently, the State Division of Oil, Gas and Mining recapped the oil well on the largest seep at Roswell Point after we had noticed that the seep was leaking at a quicker rate than others. And uh, this is that large seep. And this image is from a drone taken in 2018. If you look closely, you can see 31 white specks. These are the pelicans that were entrapped that year. And this seep, now that it's uh, been recapped, releases tar at a more natural pace and likely from natural fissures and cracks in the ground rather than the wellhead. So where am I going with this? Um, you've seen some pictures of pelicans, skeletons and tar and heard about owls. And we've talked about volcanoes and how desolate the landscape is and oil exploration. Um, would you imagine the next thing is American white pelicans? Um, and it just so happens that these tar seeps are in between the nesting grounds and the feeding grounds of these pelicans. And while out at the tar seeps, we'd often see pelicans circling overhead on their way to and from the Bear River Bird Migratory Refuge, where they would get food to bring to their babies on Gunnison Island. These birds make this 120 kilometer round trip to get fish almost every day. Uh, they choose to raise their young on an island in the middle of a saltwater lake with no fish because to them the commute is worth the price that they'd pay or is worth the price to avoid predation. Uh, for many fledgling pelicans that are heading to get their own food for the first time, Roselle Point is the first land that they can rest on and uh, unfortunately some wander their way into the tar seeps. And some of them uh, get fortunate and they can safely walk on the surface crust of the seeps and others are not so lucky and they find themselves getting entrapped. This pelican likely wandered in the seep when it was warm and the tar was too sticky to walk on safely. Well, it might seem like the seeps are a death trap for local fauna. They're excellent at preserving what gets stuck in them. Because there's so much life around the lake, it's fairly common to come upon a dead bird or animal while visiting. With millions of migratory birds that stop at Great Salt Lake, some inevitably die near the lake and occasionally they die and are preserved very well in one of the tar seeps. When looking at the seeps, we can see many years of entrapments and deaths and on the lake bed, animals aren't preserved as well and can be carried off by scavengers really easily. Um, this bird in particular uh, was, got entrapped right in front of the camera. And so it was a really good um, way to monitor the way that the animals that get entrapped in the seeps decay over time. And we got to, to watch this bird uh, throughout its entire decay process. And it was really, uh, really sad and really excellent 
uh, example of what happens at the tar seeds. So I've mentioned pelicans and owls, but we've also seen a number of other birds, mammals, and insects, and a snake entrapped in the tar. When I first began the project in the summer of 2018, we saw a, over 30 pelicans, a bunch of small songbirds, a raptor, insects, and a snake. On our trail cameras, we also saw animals scavenging on entrapped pelicans like coyotes, ravens, and rodents. We even saw a jackrabbit visiting. These animals were able to avoid entrapment by walking and scavenging on the seeps when they were colder and formed a crust that some animals could successfully walk on without getting entrapped. In 2018, at the first summer that we monitored the seeps, we didn't see any of these scavengers get entrapped. But since then, we've seen a coyote and a rodent get entrapped. These animals must have broken through the crust that they trusted to keep them out of the sticky tar. The stickiness is directly correlated to temperature and time of year at the seeps. And the colder a seep is, the less sticky and fluid it is. In the winter, you can almost walk on the seeps uh, without getting any tar stuck to you. And sometimes you can get really lucky and come out totally clean. But in the summer, if you choose to wander in like Gretchen's footprints showed, uh, you might ruin your shoes, or if you're a wild animal or a dog, you might get covered in tar and entrapped. And I know this is pretty morbid stuff, uh, but it is an incredible natural occurrence that tells us a lot about the populations around Rosal Point and the tar seeps. And it can also inform us about the modern day entrapment of animals. These seeps are actively entrapping animals, while a lot of other seeps around the world are dormant. We can use the information we gather here to help us figure out how animals became entrapped in other seeps. Uh, Kayla Martin, who's going to speak in a minute, um, she's currently working on this project and is working to create a timeline of the animals getting trapped in the seeps. It's really important because we can learn a ton from long term monitoring of an active seep. At the La Brea Tar Pits, they have collections of animals that were entrapped over the span of tens of thousands of years. And here is one of the hallways of their collections where all of these shelves and bins are filled with specimens that they've pulled out of the tar pits. Researchers there have found hundreds of dire wolves preserved in the tar, which might seem like an unusually high number, but if you do consider how long these pits were active, there may have only been entrapments of one dire wolf every few years over the span of 40,000 years. And we recently saw our first coyote entrapped and while well, we've been monitoring the seeps. This type of event might be rare year to year, but over the span of tens of thousands of years, uh, it might not look as uncommon. There might be many more that we'd see. The Rosal Point seeps will help us understand the rate of entrapment and distribution of entrapment of different species and may be able to help us inform or help inform us of the entrapment of animals at much older dormant seeps and pits. So along with scavengers and birds, there's also been a number, number of insects entrapped in the tar seeps. Um, Becky Dennis, who is another Great Salt Lake Institute and Westminster student, looked into the insects at the tar seeps and found brine flies and larvae alive on the surface of the tar and not entrapped. She also observed water boatmen and wasps along with a few other species of insects that were entrapped in the seeps. And the seeps keep getting more and more strange the closer we look at them. Uh, I know since I've stepped away from the project, I get messages from Jamie with all these new critters or new projects that are happening at the tar seeps. And Kayla Martin is currently looking and exploring the tar bubbles that have been observed at the seeps. Uh, Kayla is currently a junior at Westminster College and she's studying biology. She's super passionate about being involved in research, and she told me that to get involved with this project, she asked around a lot of faculty, and finally, Jamie was like, oh, do I have the project for you? Um, and Kayla, being extremely excited about science and uh, biology, just took it on, and it seems like she's been doing an awesome job. Um, she's actively studying the seeps and has a really bubbly personality. Uh, so I'm going to let her talk about the bubbles and her recent experience at the seeps. And she's also a major part of where this project is going. So she's going to let us know what's next for the tar seeps. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Kara. Um, 
I just wanted to first say how grateful I am to be able to take over this amazing project under such incredible mentorship of Great Salt Lake. Um, I think like Kara, it's safe to say that from the very first time that I visited the Seeps, I was completely hooked and um, obsessed. <laughs> So um, my research partner and I, Mary Sanchez, who has also recently gradu graduated from Westminster, would take any opportunity we could to visit the Seeps. And um, I must say over the past two years, we have really discovered some really interesting and weird things. Um, I've heard people say that sometimes the best discoveries happen by accident. And this definitely happened with us. We by accidentally um, set one of the cameras to take a picture every 30 seconds. Um, but as a result, I was able to make this video and we discovered this. So in the middle of one of these volcanoes, um, there's this tar bubble that literally bubbles up, expands, and then pops over a matter of minutes. So when we first saw this, we were just blown away and we had no idea why this was. So while it's really interesting and important to study all the death that happens in the seeps, um, we started to think about possible life. So Mary found this really cool paper about burping bacteria that produce methane as a byproduct of metabolic processes. And there were these scientists at the Librea Tar Pits that actually discovered this really rich, diverse microbial community. So under the mentorship of David Parrott, um, I've been sampling the tar since uh, last summer, and I'm trying to extract DNA, specifically 16S RNA for sequencing, um, because it would be really interesting to see what's living in the tar as well as what's dying there. And so um, it's been really cool and fun because tar is a very difficult medium to work with. And most of the extraction kits for DNA is um, created around doing that for, uh, for soil. So that's been really fun being able to try and play around with methodology and figure out what works and what doesn't work. There's some liquid nitrogen involved um, and it's been really fun. So along with this project, what, what are the future plans? So definitely, I think it's important, as Kara said, to continue to monitor the entrapments and what happens in the seeps and hopefully create a trend line over time, over the years and different seasons. And um, additionally, I'll be working with Greg McDonald, which I'm also super excited about. And we'll be working on a paper to discuss possible reasonings as to why animals are visiting the seeps. So for example, in the top right-hand corner there, you see Jerry the mouse. Um, he visited the seeps for about a year, around about the same time at night, half past nine to 10, we were able to capture him on the cameras until one day he got entrapped. And so now currently Jerry is sitting in the freezer at Westminster and um, we are super excited because we're gonna try and figure out uh, why Jerry was visiting the seeps. Was he feeding, feeding on certain bugs that were entrapped there um, or is there other reasons? And so I think it's just really super exciting that as time goes on, we're able to piece together all of these different um, parts, uh, pieces of information and create a more holistic approach to this really unique ecosystem. Um, so I'm really excited to see what else we're gonna discover in the future and I just wanted to say thank you again to Kara and Greg, Jamie and Bonnie and David, Great Salt Lake Institute for allowing this awesome project to just flourish. Yeah, thank you, Kayla. Um, yeah, and I, I also wanted to give a big shout out to Greg McDonald who um, has really carried this project along and been an incredible resource and mentor to me. Um, and thanks to the contributors uh, that supported this project financially, including the Westminster Honors Program, um, different NASA grants, and the Great Salt Lake Institute. Um, 
and a special thanks to Janie, who's also been uh, some emotional support for this project. Um, and thank you all for listening. Um, we really appreciate getting to share this with everybody. Thank you, everybody. I get so excited seeing all of these wonderful students presenting. Thank you so much. Um, well, now um, I, I did forget to read Kayla Martin's bio. Um, I want to make sure I want to make sure that we do that. Um, okay. So um, Kayla Martin actually came to us from South Africa, and she is a biology student at Westminster College. She works with us at Great Salt Lake Institute and has taken over this project from um, Kara. Since, since then, Kayla has been working with Dr. Dave Parrott, our assistant director, um, on investigating the potential microbial community in the tar seeps, as well as with Greg McDonald on exploring why different animals are attracted to the tar seeps. So thank you so very much. Um, and now, you know, we're gonna um, not switch gears, but we're gonna um, and. <laughs> we're gonna expand to Mars. And you might all know Dr. Bonnie Baxter. Um, I'm still gonna read about her. Um, she became a professor at Westminster College in 1998, where she teaches genetics and astrobiology. Doing research with undergraduates, Baxter has turned her molecular, molecular skill set towards the unexplored reservoir of microbial communities in Great Salt Lake, becoming an expert on strategies for life at high salinities. She has published studies on photo protection, DNA repair, microbial diversity, gene expression, and astrobiology of Great Salt Lake halophiles. She directs Great Salt Lake Institute at Westminster and serves on several state committees for the Utah Department of Natural Resources, allowing her to work closely with a host of interdisciplinary researchers working in the lake. She co-created Great Salt Lake Institute at Westminster College in 2008 and is responsible for um, this idea, this idea that she told me, oh, it's no big deal. We'll just write it. We'll just edit a book. It'll be no big deal. Everybody else will do all the work. <laughs> that will believe <be> fun. <laughs> Jamie, Jamie believes me. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Jamie. Um, it's always so wonderful to be introduced by you because you are my other half. So I really appreciate um, all those things you said. Um, I want to switch gears and get us towards Mars, and we're going to end up on Mars. Um, so we started at the site in the North Arm, and it's it's really brilliant. But I have to tell you, I have special I have special attire when I go to the North Arm. I have actually my Mars rover dress on. Um, so at the bottom are a couple of Mars rovers, um, and on the that's curiosity and spirit and on the back side is opportunity. I don't think Sojourner is on here, but sorry, Scott. Um, Scott is from NASA and he's going to he's going to bring this uh, he's going to bring this forward um, and, and on to Mars. So we're gonna we're gonna go there. Wally says I'm a con artist. You're hilarious. I am a con artist. Yeah, I started Great Salt Lake. Wally helps me get going and then we move this on to Mars. Um, so when I'm out at, um, at Great Salt Lake, I'm often thinking about Mars. And so I want to take us there. Um, I'm gonna share this. And I'm really gonna talk about a little bit of biology and a little bit about why Great Salt Lake applies to Mars. And then I'm gonna turn it over to my collaborator, Scott Pearl, who is at NASA. So he's an hour earlier, um, which means he has to wait on his wine, um, but he will talk about how this actually transitions to rovers on Mars and the current project that's going on. Jamie and I are very excited and we're hosting um, a watch party with John, John Armstrong, uh, the director of Op Planetarium, who uh, is just a little bit north of us. Um, we're very excited about February 18th, so I hope you guys look into that. So let me tell you about why life at Great Salt Lake matters when we think about potential life on Mars. Um, so Jamie showed this picture and I love it because it puts Great Salt Lake in the context of the planet. 
and you can think about, yeah, the earth. And there's that causeway, that railroad causeway that segments the water, the north arm water away from the south arm water and prevents a lot of input. And that means that that water gets saltier and saltier and richer and richer in minerals. Um, but you also can see in this picture, the Bonneville salt flats. Um, so this was a giant system um, uh, over, an, uh, over the last 800,000 years, the lake has mostly looked like Great Salt Lake, but there have been four large lake periods. And the last of those was um, about 30,000 to 15,000 years ago. So that's what we talk about as Lake Bonneville. So a lot of people start the history with Lake Bonneville and say, oh, Great Salt Lake is a remnant of Lake Bonneville. So I wanna just suggest to you that actually Great Salt Lake is the norm and the large lake episodes have been um, abnormal. But the last one we had um, was indeed uh, Lake Bonneville and it left behind this, what we call evaporite. Geologists put it end of everything to make it a rock. So it is basically a rock left behind from something that evaporated. So this is a mineral bed um, that's mostly sodium chloride because that's the, the nature of Great Salt Lake and this basin. Um, so Bonneville Salt Flats, if uh, those of you who are local have certainly driven west to Nevada, um, and if you drive west on I-80, you see uh, this kind of landscape. It's absolutely beautiful and it really does look otherworldly. So this is a salt flat and it's not unlike what we see in places around Mars. Of course, it's covered in iron dust, so it's red, but there are lots of, um, of evaporates where lakes used to be. And, and so Scott and I like to talk about this as an analog, as a place on our planet that looks like places on Mars. Um, and they are analogous, if you will, to places on Mars. This is another ISS picture by the same astronaut um, from ESA. I love this guy. Uh, he did some amazing photography. This is where um, Scott and I have done a lot of work um, around that area that if you've been to Spiral Jetty, you've been to this Roselle Point area. This is where the Tar Seeps people were also talking about. Um, so we've done work in the water and in the salts on the shore. Um, so geologists, um, as a biologist, you start to work with geologists and they have a really different language. And one of the things they do, it's kind of funny, when I started going to geology talks, I was like, who are these geologists? They always, they always put themselves in the picture, you know? Are they, are they that um, pompous that they think they should have pictures of themselves in all of their manuscripts? But actually they use humans for scale. So that's a really common thing in geology is to have something in the picture that gives you scale. In microbiology, we use a little scale bar in, you know, maybe in the micron range. Um, so I always think it's funny when you read a geology paper and they say humans for scale. So I have my own take on that. This is my um, 1977 um, Chewbacca. Um, and I, I say Wookiee for scale. And I actually just snuck this through a publisher. So this picture my students and I decided needed to be published. Um, we didn't mention George Lucas in the credits, so I'm hoping we don't get sued. But anyway, uh, he is actually exactly 10 centimeters. So he makes for an excellent scale bar. But I wanna show you that the salt around the Wookiee's feet um, is pink. And that's common in these hypersaline evaporate regions where the salt water has evaporated. It got saltier and saltier and saltier and then it evaporated and only water evaporates. Only water goes into the water cycle, right? So the salts get left behind. And that is what we think happened on Mars or also on the planet where the Wookiees are from, but that's another story. Um, so I'm gonna call these halo files and this comes from the Greek meaning salt lovers. And in this diagram of the three domains of life, halo files are here under archaea. And most people think of halo archaea as the halo files, but um, uh, you grow them on plates and they're these beautiful, rich pink and orange colors. And that's what makes the water of the North Arm the color it is. 
um, like that. And I also want to mention that there are some bacteria that are also halophiles, and there are some also eukaryotic algae and protists that are halophiles. So I don't want to leave those domains of life out, but most of the conversation in my talk, the next few slides is going to be about haloarchaea, just so you know. But halophiles is a broader term, and I will use that term from now on because halo means salt. It's the Greek version of SAL, HAL was the Greek version of the Latin SAL, where we get salt and salary and salad and all those words. So um, that root should start to be common to you. Um, so we do find halophiles in this pink water. We find lots of them. Um, I, I wanna give a shout out to my collaborator, Swati Almeida Delmet. Um, she worked with uh, Carol Litchfield, who was one of my early mentors in the halophile community. Um, and she passed away a few years ago. And I um, worked with Swati to finish some of her research that she did with Carol. Um, so you don't need to know the legend of the figure on the bottom right. All that means is every color is a different uh, genus of microbes that lived in Great Salt Lake, in this case, just Archaea. So we sampled over time and you just saw a different spread of the microorganisms every time you went to the lake. And I, I think these over time kind of longitudinal studies are really important. The point I wanna to make to you, a more general audience, is, is that this Great Salt Lake North Arm it is salinity at saturation. The water is holding as much salt as it can hold. And we still have abundant life. We have abundant life and, uh, and we have diverse life. So that should tell us that in a salt flat on Mars, if life could be there, if life was there ever before, you know, it's possible that it could still be present. It could still live in those conditions. So shout out to Swati. Um, these halophiles have superpowers and that's really what I wanna tell you about. They're part of a group of organisms we call extremophiles. And mostly we think of archaea when we think of extremophiles, but again, they're also bacteria and eukaryotes that can do extreme lifestyles. Um, and, and it is extremophiles that give us a window into the limits of life. Like how salty can life be? How hot can life be? How cold can life deal with? Um, and so these extremophile studies means that us microbiology sorts of people get lumped into astrobiology now because um, astrobiology cares when we think about life on other planets how cold is it that life can handle, right? That's an important question when you're talking about the habitability of Encephalus or Europa or Titan, some of these moons of Saturn or Jupiter. It's really important questions. Um, but again, tonight we're on Mars, so especially Mars. People used to say, Mars is too cold. Mars has too much radiation. Well, we have life on earth that can handle all those things. So um, now we're really excited about this new mission, Perseverance, that will bring back samples. So some of the superpowers I'll list rather quickly. Uh, salt tolerance, you can see halophiles on the right growing on salt crystals. You can see pink halophiles on the left growing in salt ponds where water has been evaporated to produce salt. Um, the saltier it is, the better they do, no problem. Um, they have radiation resistance, um, not only, uh, they also gamma radiation, but mostly we've talked about uh, UV radiation in some of the work that we've done, but, but they can handle lots of different sorts of radiation. That's really important. These pink pigments actually help collect free oxygen radicals that spin off from radiation assaults. So the, the, actually the colors of the organisms are really important in their biology. Um, and in helping them fend off the assaults of, of Earth, in this case, or potentially Mars. Um, lifestyle flexibility. So this is from a chapter we just wrote, and I have example references on the right. I want to give a, a shout out to Aaron Oren, who 
um, Arne, Arne is in the audience and um, he uh, had a paper that talked about perchlorate reduction. Perchlorate salts are really important because they are found on Mars um, in the 1976 Viking mission. Actually, we discovered perchlorate. So we've known about perchlorates for a long time. Um, those are thought to be reductive in really angry environments for microbes, but halophiles don't care. Um, there are halophiles that can deal with that. They can deal with broad pH uh, ranges, broad temperature ranges. They can deal without oxygen. They can use light energy to make ATP, even though they don't do photosynthesis. So they have this lifestyle flexibility, I call it. Um, they also have superpowers in that they can survive inside minerals over time. Um, I'm going to, um, hang on, I'm going to stop sharing for a minute just because I have, I have a piece of ancient salt in front of me and I want to show it to you and see if you can see any inclusions inside. This is Permian salt that's 253 million years old. Um, inside are little fluid pockets. And it turns out that halophiles can survive over time in those fluid pockets. And these are actually pictures of that um, from Tim, Tim Lowenstein's lab. Um, and there are many researchers, there's probably, I, I think about 35, 40 papers uh, or more on long-term survival of halophiles in the geologic record. So, let me just underscore how important this is. A microorganism can survive in a rock over time, over millions of years, okay? So if we leave minerals behind on Mars from evaporation and there were, and there were microbes there, maybe they're still there, right? This is why we get excited. Um, so can Great Salt Lake halophiles be entombed and minerals, and Scott's gonna mention this as well, um, but I'll just give a little shout out to some of our great Salt Lake minerals. We have sodium chloride, which we also call halite. We have gypsum. Um, some of you have collected these gypsum crystals around Great Salt Lake. Recently, Jamie and I have been involved in some studies on mirabilite. This is sodium sulfate. Um, and a question, are these minerals on Mars? So we have evidence that sodium chloride is there. We have evidence, particularly at, um, well, a number of places, but Jezero Crater, I wanna point to, cause that's where Perseverance is going. And there is a signature from infrared data that gypsum is there. So in my lab, we're actually looking at some of these clay inclusions and the ability to hold on to life over time. Um, and uh, mirabilite, these crystals here, this is important. We don't know if mirabilite is on Mars, but we do know that the groundwater, this is a study from last year, that the, there, there is salty brine seeping in the subsurface groundwater. And that's exactly what, happen, what happens to produce these mirabilite mounds at Great Salt Lake. Um, so there's some white reflective areas that could be mirabilite, but we don't know the composition of it yet. Um, so remember that Mars on the left today used to look like Mars on the right. It used to look more like Earth. Um, and so 3.5 billion years ago, as we were developing life, Mars had an atmosphere. Um, and, and the... The atmosphere started to dry up at that time. Um, they are started to disappear because of a magnetic shift and the surface water disappeared. So if, if Mars had life, it probably had microbial life and then it stopped evolution. So we, we don't think that there is gonna be giraffes and rhinoceros on, on Mars. We think that there could be microorganisms and they could be, started at this time that Earth and Mars were very similar. It, as those lakes dried up, if there was life in those lakes, as those lakes dried up, they would have gotten more salty. And, and if, if the salt, if the water completely dried up, which it did on the surface, it would have left behind Bonneville salt flats, essentially. It would have left behind minerals. 
And we know that minerals can hold on to life. So if there was microbial life on Mars in the water that dried up, could it be in that mineral record that's left behind? So I think there's three possibilities. No life was ever on Mars. We don't have evidence for life yet. Or there was extant life, existing life that's still there now. There was life and it's still there. Or extinct life. So I think extant life is interesting, obviously, because it would be cool to find life on another planet. But extinct life is also really interesting because it means Earth isn't the only place that life um, actually evolved through abiogenesis. So I think that's really an important distinction. So if this life was halophilic, right? Life, um, life in that salt in that lake that dried up would have dealt with salt. Um, and evolved to live in high salt. As the lake shrunk, the minerals concentrated. So it had to be salty. That's what happened from the Lake Bonneville to Great Salt Lake transition. So halophiles could be entrapped in the ancient salt on Mars. The other option about extinct life means, A, maybe the cells aren't there, but we could look for their molecules. And of course, halophiles are these superbugs. So we're looking for extant life or we're looking for their biomolecules that they leave behind. Um, and so I'll just leave this with, I really think Great Salt Lake halophiles are good analogs for extreme life on Mars. And I, I wanna hear Scott Pearl from NASA JPL talk about this because he, He's so great um, at bringing this, like bringing this Great Salt Lake work, this Earth work to Mars. Thank you, Bonnie. In terms of robots that go into space, the sampling and caching system on the Mars 2020 mission is the most complicated, most sophisticated thing that we know how to build. This is the system that allows us to take core samples of rocky material on the surface of Mars, carefully seal them in very sterile, clean vessels for eventual return to Earth. We've been working on the sampling and caching system for seven years, and that's because it's a tough job. We're testing the equipment to make sure that it's going to work when we get to Mars. It has to function on its own. We have to think of all eventual possibilities and try them here first. And then if they don't work, change it now uh, because we can't make any changes later. To drill into the rock on Mars, pull out intact core samples, seal them hermetically, and to be all done autonomously by a robot hanging off the end of a rover on the surface of ours has been a challenge. We've got actually three robots necessary to do the sample and caching system. Our big robotic arm out on the front of the rover, that takes our drill, pushes it against the surface and allows us to take core samples. Then we put that core sample in the bit carousel, the second robot that takes that from the robot arm and puts it down inside our adaptive caching system. This is the part of the sample and caching system inside the rover. We've got a little tiny robot, a special robot arm called the Shaw, the sample handling arm. It takes the samples out of the carousel and moves them through volume assessment, image taking, and eventually to sealing, and then replaces the cylinder containing the sample in a storage spot, all on its own in the matter of a few hours. We have designs on bringing them back in a decade. Mars has been at the fore of our consciousness about the questions of life. Could life exist in one of our nearest neighbors? I think we have a lot to learn, life or no life, about the evolution of our solar system, about our planet, by looking in depth at rocks brought back from Mars. How cool is that? So um, 
I'm fascinated kind of by these like background types of things like how do we take samples because when when I took samples for our next speaker when when Scott asked us to take samples um, this is this is actually some um, an algae that that I will use for brine shrimp but we took samples in little tubes like this and now um, on this Mars rover we're going to see the most sophisticated robot that NASA has ever built and these super clean tubes and it's just a whole world away from from um, what I'm used to for sure out at Great Salt Lake. And so I'm really excited to introduce Scott. Dr. Scott Pearl is a research scientist at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory specializing in life in extreme environments and their survival, preservation, and within the mineral and rock record. Dr. Pearl is also the co-principal investigator of the JPL Origins and Habitability Lab. Alongside JPL, Dr. Pearl is a research affiliate in the mineral sciences at the Los Angeles Natural History Museum Museum and an astrobiologist with the Blue Marble Space Institute of Science. So Scott, take it away. Come tell us all, everything you know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you for everyone for, for this whole setup. And it's it's re it's really awesome in terms of, of of all the events tonight and all the all the speakers. So I will share my screen and we'll go through uh, some of the slides. And so um, I want to start off in terms of the first real data set that I was able to work with um, when I was in college. And so um, this is back in 2005 and there's a running joke and I'll, I'll, I'll make my screen full screen after this, but um, can everyone see my screen just to make sure? Yeah, you're good. So uh, back in early 2005 um, within the Burns formation on Mars, prior to the MER rovers, these are the Mars exploration rovers, um, we had saw um, in terms of just large scale orbital data um, that there might have been channels and deltas and, and essentially old signs of water that essentially traverse through certain features of Mars. Um, but in terms of the actual timeliness and how, how long water actually interacted with the Martian regolith uh, was, was, was still to be determined. And so when it came down to understanding um, essentially water rock and water mineral relationships, uh, it was this outcrop that we saw in early 2005, and, and you can see from the backdrop uh, that we're still on the actual rover landing pad, and so we hadn't left yet, and this was the first assessment. This was the very first panoramic image, um, and you can see off in the distance um, these somewhat protruding outcrops, uh, and these are, are essentially part of the regolith that's present on, on in this crater. If you were to zoom in on any, or at least kind of see your eye on these kind of elongated bedding planes along the actual outcrop, more so in this part on the right, when you zoom in on those areas, you see features uh, that look very similar to, or at least this is actually the, the actual image you see when you zoom in uh, um, on, on that right side of the image. And so uh, my first assignment as an undergrad essentially was to piece this together. And so this is showing rounded grains that are laminated in this large cement. And so when you think of water coming down a stream, you essentially have rounded, you know, rounded pebbles and rocks to be able to skip along the water. This is equivalent to that in terms of the groundwater that essentially permeated through the surface. Now, we usually land at craters, Jezero Crater in the next um, 20 plus days. We usually land in craters uh, because it gives us a natural dig site in terms of the actual sedimentology uh, of the rocks and minerals that are present. And so what you're looking at here from, from the bottom up, if you will, uh, is going essentially deep in geologic time. And so the timing that, that the waters are present on Mars, as, as Bonnie mentioned about three and a half to 3.8 billion years ago, that timing is constrained relative to the water rock and water mineral interactions that are present um, where we can relatively date these same features. And so if you have minerals and rocks that are modified by water and those, and those minerals and rocks can be dated, you also date the water that's present that modified them. And so um, what you're looking at here is essentially um, the rise and fall of a groundwater table, of a, of a long scale um, actual groundwater table uh, that was dormant uh, um, and essentially static in these in these rounded um, or in these bedded plains. Now, if you remember back, you know, now 16 years ago, there were the Martian blueberries, which are these features that are here. These are hematite concretions. Um, the main reason why we landed at this site was 
was an iron oxide called hematite. It's 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 iron two and three parts oxygen um, that that's found on Earth with standing bodies of water and hot springs. And so this was found with a thermal emission spectrometer um, that was on board a Martian orbiter uh, about four years earlier. So when we think about water on Mars, we we immediately go to habitability. And so when it comes down to understanding if if a planet was actually habitable, you have your global extremes when it comes down to which parts are more or less habitable relative to one another. But if you have a planet that is habitable, it doesn't mean that it actually it is fully inhabited. And so in terms of life detection versus habitability measurements, those are completely different things. And so we tend to have these alongside water because as a solvent, uh, water is a uni or is is a very good universal um, solvent to have life within its own natural petri dish. And so you can think about features in terms of Europa and Enceladus, for example, certain moons in our solar system that have deep kind of ocean ice interfaces with, with, a, with a large scale ocean underneath that has present water right now. On Mars on the surface, however, these are features that uh, um, you, you've lost all the water over geologic time. And so when it comes down to the Martian timescales and so forth, um, if you're looking for extant life that's present on Mars right now, it needs to have some kind of solvent in order to actually fully go about its nutrient processes and also metabolic processes, nutrient cycling. So these are features that you would need to have some sort of, essentially in this case, kind of deep subsurface water, potentially an aquifer on Mars where the water is away from the from the dangerous UVC that's actually permeating through the surface. Um, as was was mentioned earlier, when 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 Mars lost its full atmosphere, um, the 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 full destructive power of UVC made its way through the atmosphere to essentially sterilize the whole surface. And so um, when you have these features, uh, when you, in terms of, of the Mars Exploration Rovers and also MSL, that was designed to look for habitable environments, more so MSL than MER. The Mars 2020 Rover is taking the next step in that with regard to looking for if these environments that we've deemed are habitable, what's the potential for life to, to, to have been left behind? And then as, as was mentioned before, ancient biosignatures from life that's long gone versus extant life that's present now, you have your series of questions that, that there is some overlap between what you'd be looking for, but the search for extant life and present life is only just getting started. We had a workshop last year, it was the first workshop of, of its kind to look at Mars extant life. And there's a paper that we have out now, I guess earlier in uh, last year, uh, that's the summary of that conference. And so an update to this habitability metric is it, was just accepted in terms of astrobiology, um, so so that will be out soon. So when we're so now in terms of Gale Crater, for example, what you're looking at here, um, this is where we landed in 2012. This is with the MSL rover. You're essentially kind of sitting in a in a in a former lake bed that that's all fully dried up. And so um, for the untrained eye, or at least to look at these features, you can see with my mouse. Here are these essentially layered bed crop features that that when you zoom in and i'll go into the next slide you can see rounded spherical rocks and minerals that that essentially have been physically weathered by the lake bed waters that was one that, that were once here and so again this is about 3.5 to 3.8 billion years ago so the presence of the minerals that are relatively dated to that time scale means that the waters that were present had to have been that old and so um that's a that's a very neat feature because mars doesn't have plate tectonics so when you have features, so the entire planet is one basaltic plate, if you will. They're, they're, in terms of oceans, those don't exist. And so you have these, these, these rivers and streams and deltaic features. All of Jezero Crater is actually, a giant, or at least most of Jezero Crater is actually a giant delta that I'll show in a few slides. Um, but, but the actual fluid movement in this case, if life was present in here, it essentially precipitated the minerals that have formed as those waters dried up you would see features like this. And so this is zooming in, this is the left side of the rover. And so these, these large scale microstructures um, are, are what was left behind from a former lake bed. And so it's important to note that if I was to do a Mars sample return mission, which, which you know, thankfully there's one coming up in the next three weeks, where in this work volume would I choose samples to bring back to earth and why, right? So these are questions that we have to have when it comes down to why is this spot better than this spot and better is relative to uh, us just assuming uh and 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 it, and then taking measurements to see what's actually present there and so what are the instruments that we would need in terms of a martian field site to be able to understand well this 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 has a certain metric that's higher than this and whatever this would be 
um, why would we bring that back? And so we have, a, we have um, I believe, 20, 26 sample caches. I think it, it's um, uh, in terms of spanning the entire primary mission. Um, and so we have to be selective about what we choose. So in terms of looking at this globally, and I'll, I'll kind of go into what these are, on the left side, this is this is essentially two two different rover missions on one slide, but on the left side you have these salt minerals that were essentially dug up via a trench from the Spirit rover. This is going back to 2005, 2006, um, and this is on the other side of the planet from from what I just showed in terms of Gale Creator. So there's so there was a wheel that was not working um, throughout the majority, or I guess throughout the, the the whole mission for the Spirit rover. And it was dragging behind Regolith as it was driving forward. Thankfully, there were six wheels and they were powerful, or five working wheels, and, and, and that was powerful enough to, uh, to actually dig a trench as we were going forward, depending on where we were going direction wise. So, in terms of looking back at the trench, we noticed very early on high contents of silica as well as the, uh, these hydrated salt minerals that were embedded uh, in the Martian Regolith. And so, this is, this is, just on like the like the shallowest part of the subsurface, where if you can dig your hand and move some of the regular aside, you'd, you'd actually see this. So this tells us that the groundwater table permeated up potentially through the surface, um, and we see with the Martian blueberries that these features, um, as as those waters uh, froze and evaporated potentially at the same time to yield what those iron um, other sematite spherules were, uh, this is water that that percolated through the surface and then breached the surface, and you can see this. In terms of what hasn't been oxidized yet, this is just below the, or the actual shallow subsurface. And so when you look at a certain global perspective of Mars, all the icons, and I have a, I have a larger picture of this in a few slides, um, all, the, all the actual colored icons that you see on the right side are all minerals that have been hydrated or essentially modified by fluids. So you have this really nice pattern here between the northern lowlands and southern highlands of where these fluids actually were. So if you're going to send a rover mission to a crater, you best believe that we would actually pick a site that, that has a huge majority of these icons. And so it makes sense given the natural field site that's there, but the point of it being that the timing of the fluids and what the mineral kinetics, so these are all different mineral suites. It's, it's, you know, it's, not, it's not a surprise that you have clusters of certain minerals that correspond to a certain set of kinetics of volumes of water that would actually precipitate once they're evaporated to actually form what those minerals are. And that's important to keep in mind because kinetics here on Earth and Mars are the same. So we use that for timing and it's very important. So Jezero Crater, for example, when you're looking just kind of zoomed in now in terms of, of these hydrated minerals, um, the colors on the left show what these minerals are. And so each of these seven mineral suites that you see on the left here, that corresponds to a certain set of mineral kinetics and hydrated states where if we're able to actually tease out and pick out what these minerals are compared to our relative libraries, we can get timing of those fluids. Now, in, in, this, in this deltaic region, this is Jezero Crater zoomed in um, uh, in terms of where the landing site would be near. Uh, we have features that, that correspond to those colors. So you see a trend here, just like the trend globally where you have clusters of those minerals, that same trend occurs here in terms of these deltaic regions. And so clays and the actual volume of water it takes to, to contribute and form to, and, and actually form a clay corresponds here to the volumes that you'd see in terms of where in this landing site we would be. And so Great Salt Lake, for example, is, is your kind of rewind in terms of Jezero Crater where you still have water present. And so what's happening here on the shoreline, and, and as Bonnie and, and our folks mentioned, uh, within the actual spiral jetty, you have the constant moving of those waters and precipitation of these minerals. Now, when it comes down to, to to the work that we've been doing there, um, as you're going through and getting gypsum as well as halite, you have different preservation metrics when it comes down to what you can see in terms of the carotenoid biomarkers. And so that's what makes these actual pigments pink. There's an element of photobiology where the actual halophiles are corresponding to UV A and B with it that's, that's being subjected to the salt terraces that are there. And they are producing these actual carotenoids to actually filter and fight against UV radiation. Now on Mars, when it comes down to UVC versus Earth's UV A and B, what would these features look like in terms of Jezero Crater? And so this has yielded um, a, a, a slew of results for work that Bonnie and I have started and then spinoffs um, over the last seven years. And so I'll go into some of those now. 
Um, we have a paper that is in revision right now that actually examines these same carotenoids, but hopefully the video is, clean, is, is actually showing in terms of uh, the actual cell motility. Um, but as done in previous studies, as, as well as our, our most recent paper, the HALA files that are entombed, essentially zooming into a fluid inclusion that's within a salt crystal, essentially. Um, uh, the same kind of salt crystal that Bonnie showed um, um, in, on her video, uh, you have these, these, these extremely massive halophilic microorganisms in terms of the biomass and actual biology that's present here. You can see them modal inside a fluid inclusion. Now, we use Raman spectroscopy to essentially vibrate the atoms of both the carotenoid pigments, the actual cells themselves, and the minerals that, are, that actually house all of these features all in one spectral feature. So, um, so in terms of vibrating them, it, 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 will, it will be able to actually detect all, all the organics, all the biology, as well as the mineralogy. Now, halide is Raman transparent, so we actually have, have, don't have to worry about the backdrop of the mineral here. So whenever we actually get data from you know, field samples from Great Salt Lake all, or all around the world, we have a, a, a good idea of that actual biology that's present and the photobiology that's actually occurring due to actual gene adaptation for those photobiological features, those stresses that, that they're adapting to. So with that in mind, zooming in on now what these look like on two different scales, you have the 100 micron scale on the top, A and B, and then zoomed into two microns uh, in terms of C and D. And so you have these features that as, 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 as you go through the z-axis, for example, uh, the actual focus of, of all of these fluid inclusions get higher or lower depending on as you're zooming in. And so this is not just one layer of salt crystals in terms of fluid inclusions. These are several layers within the actual mineral matrix. And so to get an idea uh, in terms of how robust this would be in terms of UVC, we've taken the beta carotene from these samples, or at least actually been able to entomb our own salt samples, and, and, and then subject them to UVC. This is what would be on Mars. And so, uh, um, well, I guess before I get into that, um, this shows that uh, in terms of the actual brine itself, on the left here, uh, you have a brine droplet that essentially, as, as you're going counterclockwise, is evaporating. And so you're getting features here um, as the brine is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, crystals are forming on their own you know, from, the, like, from those kinetics. Um, and so as that's actually happening, you have a higher concentration of these crystals as you're going counterclockwise um, as the brine is evaporating. So the salts are forming. It's so on the top right. Uh, you have these three black salt crystals that are in this 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 like this small black and white image, and the green that's shown down here corresponds to the Raman wavelengths of beta carotene that we find in Great Salt Lake. Those are all linked together, and so basically the green shows where there's overlap between the salt crystals as well as the beta carotene. So you can see the majority as as the brines evaporate, the majority of the beta carotene pigments get entombed inside the salt crystal. So you're getting a free preservation metric as as the brines evaporate. So on Mars, this is ideal, not just in terms of Jezero Crater, but the entire planet. So uh, in terms of UVC, or actual protection in terms of UVC, it's not just about preservation, but it's also about understanding how UVC can actually um, be, be fully exposed to these salt crystals and, and the same pigments are able to be uh, preserved. And so on the top right, you have just plain beta carotene that gets burned with UVC, this is 24 hours, one one Earth day of UVC, um, and in the middle you have uh, um, the same concentration of beta carotene, but now inside a fluid inclusion, uh, and that's after 120 hours uh, in terms of UVC. So this is this is about five and a half Martian weeks of UVC on this one fluid inclusion, and so you can see that that that, that there is some burning that goes on within the fluid inclusion. But again, you're not just taught. This is one layer of salt. In terms of having that pretty thick, you're allowed to, uh, um, uh, or at least in terms of preservation, as as the thickness of the salt as kind of increases, there's a better probability of that not getting burned. Um, and then having this where uh, just the powder itself. Now we found along the way that when you do Raman analyses of these three burned features, they look the same. And so this is in, this is work that's going on now that that's that's actually nearly ready to be written up, or at least almost done being written up. And so the fact that these features um, can be found in these minerals, for example, all across Mars is, is extremely critical because in terms of the UVC preservation and the Martian dust to actually provide some layer of protection against the UVC, um, it bodes well for, for, for actual preservation of these features. And so um, 
the I guess the previous paper to follow along with this. This is this is in in revision right now, uh, just in terms of seeing the actual diversity of features that are preserved in these salt crystals as well as gypsum, uh, both. Uh, this is both calcium sulfate as well as sodium chloride. Um, there is a trend between, uh, or at least a difference between the actual diversity if you have halite versus gypsum, and that and that bodes well because iron is actually present in in all of the samples that have gypsum. That that's the actual greenish, dark parts that are here, and so the presence of iron leads to different microbial communities that are preserved inside the gypsum, and that's important because iron on Mars is prevalent, and so. Um, the difference in terms of DNA preservation between samples that have no iron and samples that have iron is, is about six to eight times more, more volumetric DNA inside the gypsum versus the halide. So that bodes very, very well because gypsum uh, is found on Mars. And so again, going back to these features, these are gypsum veins that are found inside Gale Crater alongside gypsum crystals that are found at Great Salt Lake. And that's my finger for scale, but these are a lot smaller. But the point is, we know from Mars, they can survive over geologic time. And so I've, I'll, I'll end with that, but I wanted to just to have folks understand and essentially think about the questions of now that we're going to get samples back, where should we look inside Jezero Crater, uh, both within the, work, the, uh, the actual work volume and uh, what we can take back with us to Earth. And so I want to thank everybody for your time, um, and I want to thank my, my research group and then Bonnie, Jamie, and, and all the folks here that, that just put this together. So thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. I forgot to tell everybody what I was drinking today. Um, I already, I had my street tacos yesterday because I can't eat during these. I'm supposed to be running them, but I had street tacos and thinking about the, the asphalt at the tar seeps. And, um, and it reminded me of a program. I'm gonna link to this program in the comments right now. Um, we worked with Steampunk Academy and they invited a man named Chris Carberry to talk to us about a book he wrote about alcohol in space. And it, it, it is really a very interesting book. He was telling us that, um, you know, really alcohol in space is not um, um, very um, acceptable. But um, one time, I think it was, um, they sent up bottles of brandy with the Apollo 8 mission, but, but then it wasn't acceptable to drink these. And so they kind of brought them back. And one of these bottles that came back, um, a, a little mini bottle of brandy sold for $18,000 once it came back to earth. Um, and, um, and Buzz Aldrin, he is probably the only person that's ever had a drink. He had um, some wine on the moon while he was on the moon um, for communion and, and probably the only person to drink on another planet. Um, but check out that um, the interview on YouTube that I just linked to. It's um, the man is, you know, the, the person who has done this is super interesting. And so I now thank you everybody for giving us your time and expertise and taking us to Mars. And if all of the panelists will please turn your videos on and your um, microphones and we will um, answer some questions. And um, the first questions um, that we had are about the tar seeps. So maybe we can go back to the tar seeps for a minute. Um, um, Aaron Oren asks, if methane is formed below those bubbling tar pits, what is the local salinity? Um, and I'm gonna let I'm gonna let Kayla. Kayla's thought about this a lot. Um, I'm also gonna share my screen with you because I have a video that goes right along. So Kayla, if you want to talk. Thank you, Jamie. That's a really, really good question. So um, the salinity of the tar is actually much, much lower than the lake. So Jamie's gonna share a video of the fresh water that's coming out of the volcanoes. So we're not really looking at halophilic methogens, but rather bacteria and archaea. Um, also, it's hypothesized that the bubbles are not only due to the are not only caused due to the burping bacteria, but also due to positive flux of methane that's coming from these gas reservoirs that um, are beneath the surface of the Earth, which is very common to. Um, 
I love this video. It's actually really satisfying. <laughs> um, but that are actually very common to naturally occurring tar seeps. And so I'm just going to link in the chat some a couple of papers that speak about this. Um, but that's a really great question. Um, but yeah, we're, we're looking more about at um, archaea and bacteria that can undergo methagenesis. Let me just link that. How hard is it to extract fossils from the tar seeps? And how does the tar affect the fossils positively or negatively? It sounds like it preserves them. What's going on there? And that's from Carissa Killian. Hi, Carissa. She's a GSLI student. <laughs> Um, you want I, me to? Greg, I think you're the best uh, best suited for this question. Okay. Um, actually, one of the really nice things about uh, bones and uh, that get preserved in tar from uh, like Ranch La Brea is they actually still retain the original collagen. And so uh, you don't get hair, you don't get feathers, but the bones are preserved. They're very well preserved. And they um, have all of the original organic material that is in the bone in terms of the collagen. So it's very excellent preservation uh, for the fossil record. Great. Um, I'm gonna go, uh, I want to go to, I'm trying to decide, there's so many good questions. Um, Peter asks, um, this is about evaporites and fluid inclusions. So in contrast to fluid inclusions in evaporite minerals, what about fluid inclusions that are known to occur in some agate geodes? If these are formed in an active volcanic area, is there a chance for life forms in that fluid? anybody want to take that? So, so it depends on the actual nutrients. So in terms of, of the monitoring the fluid inclusions over time, the longest uh, setup that we had uh, was uh, nearly two weeks where we had the cameras on um, and essentially doing Raman spectra of the change in, in all of those organics over time. And so while it wasn't a significant change because the, I guess the appetite of those halophiles um, uh, versus the, the, the fluid include the the fluid inclusion substrate. Um, you have significantly more nutrients than you have microbes to start off to start off with, right? So, um, in terms of, of what's available for their for their food, in terms of their other actual energetics, um, it would depend. And so, um, the fluid inclusions within halite versus gypsum, especially if there's iron inside the gypsum, um, that would bode well for not just preservation, but but the continued extent actual activity over time. So um, it would depend on, on what the minerals are made up of. And it doesn't have to be pure halite and pure gypsum. If you had features that are that are embedded along with them, um, life adapts very, very quickly. And, and all of biology is slower than any geology. So so you have the features that, that would be able to potentially utilize that for any kind of nutrients over time. Wait, you meant faster than geology. Biology is yeah. faster. Yeah. Isn't that what I said? No, you said you said slower, but biology. You oh, meant faster. Yeah, meant faster. Yeah. faster. Yeah, biology is faster. Yeah, Scott's always telling me this. I think it's beautiful. Um, I I also think that the temperature and the formation of agates is um, above the um, temperature limit as we understand it of life on Earth, but I may be wrong about that. There may be agate formation that happens at temperatures that I understand. Uh, I think 114 degrees Celsius is kind of the current max temperature for life on Earth. Um, so, so I think the formation of agate happens at a higher temperature than that. I could be wrong. How come it takes so long to get the Mars samples back? <laughs> right. Um, no. So, uh, <laughs> um, so in terms of the orbits of Earth and Mars, uh, every so one. One Mars year is two Earth years. So in terms of every two years, um, there's what's called closest approach. And that's a window of, 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 of time that we're actually in right now uh, in terms of, of the next Mars rover landing. So on its shortest, it takes seven months uh, to get from Earth to Mars and then vice versa. So um, in terms of samples, the, the, the actual Mars sample return 
campaign is not is is starting with Mars 2020, but there are future campaigns once the samples are cached to essentially have a fetch rover to come uh, and bring the samples that were cached, uh, and then a third setup to then have the samples uh, sent from Earth from from Mars back to Earth, and so um, it takes time just because the, these same windows. Unless you launch every two years, or you have your your whole kind of infrastructure launch at the same time. It'll it'll take another two years. So we'll, in terms of sending future rovers, it'll be at that cadence where every two years, um, there'll be a, there'll be potential or, in terms of that 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 whole time frame, uh, there'll be um, uh, those future campaigns to bring those samples back. I have so many questions about the Mars samples, Scott. <laughs> What do you do when you get these Mars samples back? You get these little tubes that have Martian samples in them. I mean, you don't just open those up in your lab and smell them and check them out. I mean, how, what's the plan for those? How, how do you go about that? Yeah, so um, a lot of this is still in work um, just because of the sheer amount of infrastructure that you need not just in terms of laboratory space but, but in terms of just it being sterile and, and, and in terms of biosafety level protocols and how we should actually treat this um so so when it comes down to your most sterile environments on earth uh for 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 earth features that you're looking at um then you have to keep in mind um uh what the questions are in terms of what you're actually looking for and so one one a question that I, I usually start with is, should we be looking for DNA on Mars, right? And so, so in terms of, of the evolutionary way that life evolved on our planet, um, uh, is, is, is all of DNA and RNA an Earth-centric evolutionary point? Or should we be looking at features that are earlier in terms of Earth, I guess Earth's own evolution uh, to be looking for those features on Mars? And so um, uh, I'm, I'm in the camp of we shouldn't be looking for DNA and RNA outside of Earth, but, um, and I have those reasons, and we're not going to know what the answers are until we find a second point of life and then confirm that we're not measuring ourselves via contamination with the rovers. And that's a, that's a whole other story, but yeah. All right. I, I'm in the DNA RNA camp, and I think Scott and I are going to have a cage match fight over this one day. Oh, can mm -hmm. we stream it live? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Could we call the lights around my? Uh, so I'm not sure if that's if that's nature saying yes. Everything just just flickered. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, can we call the fetch rover the rover rover? <laughs> the, your round, the river roundup. Yeah, <laughs> um, it's it's actually a really cool idea that you. Um, you, you know, this rover will make a cache of samples. I like to call it the parking lot where it stacks the samples, but NASA calls it the cache, but there will be a pile of samples that are all sealed in these tubes. And, and then the next rover will grab those and send those into orbit. And then there's this, you know, elaborate orbit, uh, orbital between NASA and, and the European Space Agency, this elaborate, orbital retrieval system. But, you know, if Elon Musk gets his stuff together, then it's possible, if he can stop tweeting and focus on science, it's possible that, you know, we could have private, a private mission to Mars and a, hu a human mission to Mars that brings back samples earlier. But, you know, NASA and ESA, they have to be ready. They have to be ready just in case Elon Musk like crashes, which could happen. Um, well, Anna is here. <laughs> Vicky wants to know if the samples are coming back in a Tesla. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> as long as it's a sterile Tesla, we'll be okay. <laughs> um, Anna, Anna is uh, one of the students in Bonnie's um, uh, astrobiology class, and she also does a lot of work with us. Hi, Anna. Um, she wants Hi. to know. If you were in charge of sample collection on Mars, what would your metrics be? Inclusions focused on halide or gypsum? Go, Scott. What's your? Okay. So, I mean, it's uh, it, it, it depends. So, I mean, with the UVC work in mind, uh, gypsum uh, performs a little better 
uh, in terms of preservation, just just in terms of beta carotene. So if we're looking for for extinct life um, that has stained the crystal per se, um, gypsum would be a little bit better. But but you once you essentially increase your sample size with respect to depth. So if I if I'm if I'm thinking of the actual gypsum crystals of Great Salt Lake, for example, the majority of those crystals, the parts that have the iron, are embedded inside the regolith. Now on Mars, when it comes down to features being partially exhumed and partially submerged inside the regolith, um, once you are in that uh, kind of submerged state, if you will, or kind of dug in state, um, you're okay in terms of UVC. There, you you only need maybe a few centimeters, um, and, and and that as heavily is dependent on the grain size of the Martian regolith. And so if if they're if they are smaller grains and they're well packed you have very little permeability and so not just for sunlight but for uv radiation it does get get hindered so you're able to get a a um a non-modified kind of shallow subsurface so um i if i if i had to choose um in terms of what what mars would then reveal in terms of jezero crater sure i would go i'd go with gypsum um but it doesn't but that doesn't discount as all of halite for example and so it just depends on, on the size of the sample I think Aaron and I are hoping that halide is there. Oh, I, me too. <laughs> yeah, we're uh, we're all about the halide. I mean, if if you know if you, if you have gypsum, you in terms of the actual kinetics, you'll you'll have halide somewhere. It's just a matter of how much water volume is your input fluid. So if you have one, you'll have the other sometime. That's what you've taught me. <laughs> Does Mars have seasons? And if so, is there an ideal season or time to collect the samples? Yeah, so so Mars Mars does have seasons. Um, uh, again, one one Mars year is two Earth years. So 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 a Martian winter is significantly longer than an Earth winter. Um, so it's not that they're. I mean, in terms of and we we've seen, you know, essentially morning dew and frost and in, in, in very early sunlight periods inside Gale Crater. And so um, I forget. I think it was the Dan instrument uh, that was able to. Uh, heat up some of the surface to essentially show that that frost is is actually being removed. Um, so uh, so yes, Mars Mars does have seasons, um, and there's no particular time or at least preference in terms of when you would collect samples, as long as um, uh, any frost and kind of morning kind of Martian morning dew doesn't get in the way. Um, but but in terms of of, of actual you know um, the actual dew point and those features on Mars. It would be interesting to collect some of that for, you know, for a return sample. So if you're if you're looking for for Martian morning dew, go in the winter. If you're looking for um, more of a clean sample in terms of dust, go in summer. Yeah. <laughs> the, those early rovers, at least Spirit and Opportunity, I felt like were the Energizer bunnies. They were supposed to go six months, and they went years. You know. Three months. Yeah, 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 yeah. Three months is was their target. Oh man, they went. Three months. And they, uh, mm -hmm. Opportunity, uh, I think, was f fifteen or sixteen years. Wow! So, yeah. yeah, that's why you have to. That's why you have to short sight your goals because then, if the goals go on, then you look really fabulous. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful. Does anybody have any? I think we're out of questions. Are there more questions that people have? Always undersell, says Anna. <laughs> I'm writing that down as your tagline. <laughs> oh, man. I hope we've um, expanded your mind from Great Salt Lake to Mars. Um, if you're really excited, like I have been getting so excited about the Perseverance landing um, and all of the excitement leading up to it, please join us. Um, there's a link that I put in the chat box. It has all of the events that we've linked to. It has um, every link that we've shared with you in the chat um, that you can go back and um, look at those. Um, oh, we might have a couple more questions. Um, so Preston, this one more question from Preston about how long has um, the Roselle Point been collecting specimens? How long have we been collecting those? Yeah, so well, it depends on what kind of samples. So yeah. in 2018 was when we first started 
um, collecting animals and, and such. And then um, since then, I know that the, the uh, bubbles and that sort of samples, oh, geologically, I don't know. I, I'm not sure on that. <laughs> well, geologically speaking, as uh, Jamie mentioned, as was mentioned before, the, the lake level has gone up and down in the past before people started taking water out of the Bear River. So at times when the lake level was high, we don't get tar seeps forming. Uh, as you mentioned, when tar gets to the water, it forms little tar balls, it flows to the surface. And it's only when the lake level goes down that it spreads out on, on the floor of our former lake bottom. One of the things that would be very nice to do would be to drill down next to the asphalt seeps and look at the intervals of which between each of these layers that have tar and the ones in between where the sediments are laid down in the lake. And that if we could get radiocarbon dates, if we got bones or wood out of those different layers going down, we could work out a chronology and tie it into changes in the lake level. That's brilliant. I'm not sure if Wally is on the call anymore, but um, Wally Gwen would be um, the right person to answer the question. Um, Wally worked for the Utah Geologic Survey for years and did a lot of work, um, uh, actually harnessed a lot of work by other people as well as did his own work um, around the lake to do hydrogeology. And um, I'm guessing he would know um, he also edited uh, two uh, compilations on Great Salt Lake. We, we call him Mr. Great Salt Lake. So uh, he was here earlier, but I don't know if he's here um, still. Anyway, um, Wally's descriptions of sampling out at the tar seeps go way back, um, but mostly it was for oil exploration. So there was drilling. I don't know if those cores are available at Utah Geologic Survey. You might know though, Greg, um, have you have you searched through their records? No, I hadn't hadn't pursued that. Um, I'm assuming that well, it would just be a matter of contacting yeah. whoever's in charge of the core library there, yeah. the UGS, and see what they have. Yeah, I I took him um, bake I baked scones for him the other day because he actually cut some stromatolite samples for me. So maybe I'm in on good graces with him having sent him baked goods. So I, I, uh, I uh, will inquire, but that that's an excellent question. I think there are, there are core samples from all over Great Salt Lake, but I don't, uh, that have been stored um, showing uh, life over, or life over time, rocks over time, essentially. And um, I don't know the essence of when that started and, um, you know, the spatial distribution of that and the temporal distribution of that. I'm not sure the time and space. Um, but we have been sampling microbes out at the North Arm at Roselle Point since 1998. And before us was Fred Post, who worked um, in the late 70s. He was a food microbiologist, but he was like, nobody's studying Great Salt Lake. I think I'm going to go out and take some samples. And he published some papers, which was really cool. Um, but it was before molecular biology, so he couldn't really um, tell us all about all of the life forms that we can discern today. So um, we've we've been looking at life there for um, at least since the late '70s, but geology has been going on way longer. Um, is there geothermal activity associated with the seeps, or is it just pressure? Just pressure. It's basically, um, if you go to uh, Google Earth and you look at the seeps, you'll know there's lots of them out there. There's hundreds. They're all different sizes. Uh, some are natural. Some are the result of the drilling. Um, but you'll notice that they all the, all the natural ones tend to form along lines. So there's faults through there that are providing the fracture that's allowing the oil that's below the surface to get uh, up to the top. And because it's a flat lake bottom, it just spreads out. So we don't get tar pits like at Los Angeles where you get deep pools there. I think the flypaper analogy is the best example that mm -hmm. it comes up, it spreads out 
And during the summer when it's hot and sticky, it's better at entrapment. And during the, when it's cooler, either in the evening or in the wintertime, we're probably not getting entrapment. But it's all definitely, there we go. You can definitely see from this uh, how they tend to form lines, which are probably uh, fault lines that the oil is seeping up through. Nice. Um, Ellie wants to know, can the general public visit the seep safely and without a guide? Um, you, you sure can. Um, I'm going to try to talk and bring up Google Earth right now for the actually Kara, can you bring up uh, Google Earth and share um, Google Earth uh, of the seeps with us? Yeah, give me a minute. Okay, so you can go out there. Um, it is there's a little road that goes just right before um, that's right before you get to the spiral jetty and there's a little parking lot that you can park in um, that there it, you just walk out onto the salt flats and you will find um, there's a there's a jetty that you can walk on and you can find different seeps you'll see our cameras out there we have the motion activated cameras that you can see from quite a distance um, I would, winter is the best time to go because um, they're not sticky. Um, I would definitely make sure if you take a dog, you put your dog on a leash. And if you take your kids or your um, spouse with you, um, make sure you wear shoes that are, uh, can get, can get ruined in the tar. I thought you were going to say, put your kid and husband on a leash. <laughs> <laughs> You could do that too. <laughs> All partners must be on a leash. Sorry, so it's taking a second to pull it up. One of the things that we try to do is, is if we go out in the winter time, because the, the tar is firm, we can walk out into the larger seeps and look for animals that are trapped in the middle. In the summertime, we have to do our inventories along the periphery, because if you tried walking out in the middle, you, you might actually contribute to the faunal ac accumulation. Uh, so uh, you have to you pick your time of year carefully, but we take advantage of the fact that the tar is firm in the wintertime in order to be able to examine areas that we normally would not be able to get to during the summer. Awesome, thank Trying you. To show you. Right now it's showing you where I'm at. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it looks a little green for Utah. Looks a little <laughs> bit like Alaska. Yes, yes. You're taking us to, I think, Spiral Jetty. That's the easiest way to navigate to the seeps if you're out there. Are you having a lot of snow this year, Kara? Our snow is so low in Utah. It snowed like two or three feet in uh, November, October, November, and it hasn't snowed since. It's the one of the longest dry spells on record for Fairbanks. Yeah, welcome to climate change. Yep. All right. Can you all see this? Yes, ma'am. So that's Spiral Jetty. That's the end of the road that you'd find yourself out on. And you can see just down the lake bed from there, you see this kind of oil jetty what we call it and this little parking lot down here and you can walk your way out on on the jetty um if the lake bed's a little squishy like it can get sometimes um but you can typically walk out here and right along here is a bunch of old pier pilings um and you can find all of the seeps that you could ever dream of finding out um on the lake bed just near the jetty Thank you so much, Kara. And you can walk there from Spiral Jetty. I like to take the little, you know, walk along the shoreline and go um, exploring. Yeah, it's super cool. And the, the lake sometimes comes closer. Um, it, it changes depending on the time of year you're out there. It can be very far away or it can be really close and you can go right up to the pink water. 
Good. Well, I think, you know, we're right at our time and I want to thank everybody for coming. We will have um, all of these recordings on our YouTube channel. Um, and we are looking forward to the landing of the Mars rover and working with the planetarium, John, up at Weber State. Um, and again, just thank you for coming. And we'll see you on either February 18th um, for the landing or February 11th for our next salty, our last salty science series about brine shrimp and microbialites. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Jamie, for everything. Thanks, everybody.